Um, I've been, I said, I've, I'm honored to speak at this event, and I've been involved with ESAPI going back to August 2009. And I've been the project leader on it since like January 2012 or somewhere or, or 11 or something like that. Um, it seems basically it was like when I was in kindergarten. Um, of course, I'd also be remiss if I didn't, you know, say that the views that expressed here in this uh, talk are solely my own, do not represent necessarily the thoughts or opinions of the OWAS Foundation or any of my employers, whether uh, current or previous. Um, okay, so a couple of objectives here. And before you look at this slide and say, thank you, Captain Obvious, but duh, let me say that I've been doing development for almost 30 years before ESAPI without realizing all these nuances, right? Um, but I wanna show you the following points that basically library development is very different than typical product development that, um, you know, there are unique challenges facing a developer, a library developer faces that I'm hoping to show you. Um, early success can be a problem. And I'm going to give some examples uh, of that later on. And then um, FOSS is different than business development. And I will discuss the lessons. I'm going to go through the lessons learned basically first by talking about process then people then technical. And then each perspective is going to have four sections, like an overview of what it's about. And then the, what was done right, what was done wrong, and and the things that basically the ugly hacks that were done, or it's not really neither good nor bad, but just, you know, probably could have been better. So first, the process perspective, and that's basically um, things like, you know, realization like uh, libraries and applications are different. They're different in design, they're different in testing and documentation. Um, the major difference, I think, that basically is that if you think of like um, the process that we use for applications, especially in the agile world, right, we basically say refactor early and often. Um, in a library world, once you put out that release 1.0 and you have clients, those clients lock into that. And if you want to keep those clients, um, you cannot be changing interfaces to them, right? So that's the major thing, I think. The other thing is that um, developing security libraries versus other libraries, a lot of, um, you know, I've actually reviewed uh, past eight years, I've been on a code review and I've done uh, a lot of reviews of FOSS security libraries and stuff like that. And a lot of times they're some of the worst written things. We as a community do not eat our own AppSec dog food a lot of times. Right. And then the other thing is that basically there's effects when we try to change processes. Right. So the good thing about ESAPI is that things started small with simple expectations. Right. Um, the original vision was basically a library that was pretty much only interfaces. But the problem is, how do you test an interface? How do you know that you got the interface right? You have to have some kind of like example code or something that you write. So it turned into a reference model. Well, that got bundled, which was probably a poor idea in hindsight, but it got bundled with the interfaces. <clears throat> so um, the bad perspective is like some of the things is we, we went through, uh, before I joined, they were at 1.4. When I, they were doing the 2.0 uh, release candidates when I joined um, and going from we didn't have really any clear migration plan from 1.x to 2.x. Generally, when you know from semantic versioning, when you go through a major release number change, you don't necessarily have to promise that all the interfaces um, uh, have to remain the same. But they pretty much tried to keep them the same regardless, and that included basically a lot of the broken crypto code that I took over in. So we tried to like keep the old 1.4 encryptor interfaces and just add new ones on top of that. And then I deprecated the old ones, but it turned out in hindsight, right? That was actually largely responsible for one <clears throat> of the two CVEs that were later discovered in, in ESAPI. 
Um, <coughs> also, you know, there was a no, we didn't have a plan for becoming a, a victim of our own success, right? There was a lot of po parts of Ease Happy that became very popular early on, partly because there wasn't any other alternatives. The ones that I come to mind are the encoder and validator interfaces and to some degree, the safe logging. Um, the encoder was even recognized in some as defense in some SAS tools like uh, Fortify and Veracode. Right. But that diverted attention from other areas where all we had, because we were doing a reference implementation, um, where all we had was basically toy uh, implementations like Authenticator and Access Controller, which were completely file-based, and they just didn't scale at an enterprise level. And the E in, in ESAP was supposed to be enterprise. Um, the ugly part was that... Uh, we didn't give very much consideration to a library development differs from application development. And I mentioned this kind of already the, you know, the agile reflecting on constant refactor. You can't do that. You just can't do that. Uh, you cannot refactor public classes. Um, and one of the things that, or, or interfaces, right. And because we did this before Java eight and Java modules were available, it was like very difficult, um, couldn't really guarantee the direct use of implementation classes or classes that were not intended, you know, that were intended to be private. So they sort of became the public interface as well, right? The other thing is how do you security test the library? Well, unlike say REST APIs, you cannot like just generally fuzz them because, you know, you have strong typing in Java that makes that difficult. So you just can't like say, oh, we've got this string. I'm just going to change, you know, fuzz the string or whatever. So we had to do a lot of unit testing. Um, and a lot of that was just really, you know, in my opinion, not up to snuff until much later on, like maybe 2.2 or whatever. Um, the people perspective, uh, I can't really present, you know, a complete perspective because I didn't get involved with the 1.x development, but um, this is sort of discussing how the people that were uh, involved and in, uh, and the succession of the leadership in fact affected the uh, uh, ESAPI. So the good thing was that they had some really top-notch people working on this. Um, it was started off by Jeff Williams and then Jim Manico kind of took over as sort of the project leader. You know, I don't know if it was a formal thing but um and he kept it running really smoothly and jim was really good because he's uh you know i'd say he's like an evangelist right he would go out and get all these people to participate and we had you know at one point in time probably a dozen people working on it um but uh we had a lot of initial enthusiasm up to the 2.0 uh ga release right and then the other thing is that um Technical disagreements were handled very professionally and transparently on a public mailing list. It's not like, uh, you know, Twitter where people do uh, Twitter storms and stuff and hide behind handles that you don't necessarily know who they are and, and things like that. So for the most part, all the technical discussions were very civil. Um, the bad part, though, was that I think uh, in terms of passing off the succession after Jim decided he needed to step away, um, that good technical leaders in the business world do not necessarily translate to the FOSS world, right? And then the other thing was picking your next successor by suddenly stepping down and putting in two of the most involved committers as co-leaders is not a good strategy unless you have some kind of plan to stand by them and be able to help them. And Jim just didn't have the time to do that. So, both of those bullets, I, I can't speak for Chris Schmidt, who was the other project co-lead, but both of these bullets definitely would apply to me. In the first case, like the first bullet, I had no experience uh, in volunteering in the FOSS world other than doing a couple of like, you know, very, very small uh, pull requests uh, to correct bugs. Um, in the business world, I do fine as a technical leader, but as a completely different environment, right? Um, because it's not a volunteer environment. The second... Um, point is if you remember at least like me right growing up as a kid where you see these cartoons right they have a line of people 
And they say, all the volunteers, please step forward. And there's this one clueless sap that stands in line and everybody else takes a step backwards, leaving that unlucky sucky saying, what the heck just happened? Well, I kind of felt that that was me when uh, Jim Manico uh, selected Chris Schmidt and myself to be project co-leaders. So, oh, so did, oh okay. But um, I've been told I have a face for radio or maybe podcasts in the 21st century here, but no, seriously, um, the ugly part was that after the 2.0 uh, general availability release, pretty much all the other help disappeared except for Chris Schmidt and myself. And we basically, you know, handled about 98% of the, the work, all the bug fixes and, you know, and releases and everything. The previous regime didn't pass on any details of how to actually do a deployment. And Chris eventually figured it out, but he didn't document it. And then Chris had to leave because he had other personal commitments with his work and changing jobs. So the technical part, uh, the discussion, the issues around architecture and design, what I learned. All right, so it started with interfaces, as I mentioned, right? Um, Jeff Williams' original idea was just to get the vendors to do various reference implementations themselves. And that's one of the reasons why he made a very liberal FOSS license, a BSD-3 license. Um, and, but those interfaces were even intended to expand different programming languages. And originally we had like, there was one for, you know, PHP and Cold Fusion and JavaScript and .NET and a bunch of other ones. All right. So, um, but it's just, it's hard to build an interface in a vacuum and it's even harder to know you did it right. Right. So you have to have some kind of reference implementation to test yourself. And like I said, we made the mistake of basically releasing that with the rest of the interfaces. Um, the other good thing, though, is it was property driven, so you were like able to easily change your implementation. If you wanted to do your own implementation, say of an encryptor or an encoder, you could just you know write your own stuff according to the interface, and then put in your own implementation and in the properties file, and it would pick it up. All right. <clears throat> so the bad part. Um, ESAPI was designed uh, to include basically all the prevalent security controls that would address or help address at the time, which probably was like 2011 or something like that, I think, uh, the OWASP top 10 stuff, right? So um, what they did is they took all the security controls and put them in one library. And in hindsight, that was a bad idea. Um, <coughs> A monolithic library pulls in way too many dependencies, right? Um, and so, like, if you only wanted to use one thing, like the encoder or the encryptor or whatever, you pull in the transitive dependent, the dependencies, direct dependencies, and transitive dependencies for everything, right? Um, all those dependencies were constantly involved, you know, re relating for us to basically have to, you know. Uh, you know, one of the top uh, that creeped into the top 10 OWASP top 10 was uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. Um, that became a problem, a constant problem. And in fact, that's what's been driving the last couple of releases, the point releases that we've been doing is just trying to keep up with that. But the other thing is that the more dependencies you have, eventually they stop supporting the version of Java that you're using, right? So we keep on having to update. We started out with Java 5 and then went to Java 6 and then went to Java 7. And pretty soon we're going to have to go with Java 8 because we have dependencies that, you know, are not getting patched. Then if they uh, have a vulnerability in them, we're going to have to go to Java 8, right? Um, the other thing was we had an uncontrolled um, bloat of just, um, you know, some of the interfaces. I mean, it just became overwhelming. They should have been split out. And then um, we had uncontrolled growth of ESAPD properties files. One of the things was that every time, every time we ended up um, doing a, a property, we had to add something to like the security configuration interface. And that became completely bloated, right? Um, oh, the other thing, singletons, they were a bad idea, right? I mean, 
I don't see there was really any purpose for using a singleton, but we didn't really need them. Um, and initially we botched them because they were using C++ as double locking pattern, which is not valid for Java. So initially the singletons were not thread safe. And then we also have uh, at least three singletons, and this is still current in the case and can't change it because, right? But default encoder, default security configuration, and default validator all have public constructors. So when you make singletons, you're supposed to make the constructors private uh, to force people to use the like the get instance method. Um, <coughs> um, so uh the ugly part of this um there's a we have radical dependencies on the properties and logging and exception handling and all those things kind of like were very tightly coupled with each other right so like for instance almost everything basically used our internal logger uh the security configuration was the only exception to that um, it had special login because you hadn't yet figured out what logger you're supposed to use, right? Um, and then there was like enterprise security exception. So we had this exception stack. And one of the things that it did, enterprise security exception, like had like intrusion detection stuff in it. So like it would automatically log stuff for you, right? And then the logger basically had a dependency transitively to the user uh, interface. Um, so that was, which was used for the logger to log like an authenticated user. Otherwise it would like put anonymous down. <clears throat> and then like, and, and, and if you're kind of wondering what I'm talking about, sometime when you have a chance run uh, Maven site and look at the J depends output sometime and you'll, you'll see this uh, problem in the first bullet that I mentioned here. The second one is basically the implementation class default security configuration. It's just a sin against mankind. I don't know how any other way to say it. I mean, it is the poster child for the phrase backward compatibility is the curse of software design, right? It started out that they like said, okay, you know, use like a default a, in look for your default or look for the esappy.properties file in like java.home system property, right? And then they kept on like saying, oh, we want to find it here in the class path, we want to find it as a resource or whatever. And so there's like about five different steps. And it's just very complicated how to explain how to do that. I mean, we do have it documented in that particular implementation class, but it's like by far probably close, you know, I would say very close to the number one question that we get asked about, um, on uh about esappy and like say stack overflow right it's almost always like i can't find the e my my stuff isn't finding the esappy properties please help right and we answered it like uh, dozens of times but um it's just you know it's just way too difficult um also there was too many major ill-time changes made at once right we went from uh google code and subversion to GitHub and Git. Now, the Google code thing, we were kind of forced because they were, Google was shutting it down. And I didn't really have a problem going from Google code to GitHub. That wasn't a big deal for me, but subversion, which I had used and going to Git, which I had never used and, and they're kind of radically different um, was a big deal for me, especially since I do like, unlike most people, like I said, I'm a dinosaur and, um, you know, I do everything pretty much like from the shell command line, like bash or corn shell. And then the other thing was uh, changing from Ant to Maven. That was even worse for me because like with Ant, at least you could see, you know, all the actions of what it was doing right there in, you know, uh, the, the XML script. But with Maven, it's like all the magic is done in whatever particular Maven plugins you have. And there are seemingly hundreds of them. And I mean, in my opinion, right, Maven is not your friend. I mean, it's like, and, you know, I tried like to get help from the OWASP mailing list and all I got kind of were dumb looks or no responses or whatever. And, um, so that just, you know, it didn't work out. I mean, it was like, it took me, that was the biggest reason why we didn't have um, a release.
lease for like a gap of almost two years because I was trying to figure out how to do the deployment, the stuff that was in the uh, palm.xml file just was not working, right? And then the last thing, we trusted uh, NSA for a code review. Now, that's part of my fault because I wrote the crypto code and there wasn't really anybody else that understood it. And I could tell that because it was just totally botched in the 1.4 release. So I said, I need some second pair of eyes on it. This is like tricky stuff to get right. Um, I advertised on a couple crypto mailing lists for people to help. And um, <clears throat> one person only got one inquiry and that person said, yeah, I'll do it for $30,000. And that didn't seem right because like the crypto code was only about like 8,000 lines of code if you include, you know, comments and stuff. That just didn't seem like a very good deal for a, you know, a nonprofit. Um, right. But to our credit, you know, I mean, this was pre-Snowden. Um, but the one thing is it kind of makes me suspicious that we had a CVE, specifically CVE-2013-5679. Uh, which was there because of a 1.4 backward compatibility interface. And it really, it was just it basically allowed you to bypass the, the message authentication code on a, on a crypto ciphertext stuff um, in, in a very trivial fashion. And I just really can't believe, it's hard for me to believe. I mean, I suppose you can say plausible deniability, but if the NSA crypto experts couldn't find that, then we're all doomed, right? So um, either they found it and they didn't say anything or whatever. Now they did say other things. They found a couple of things where we didn't do cross-site scripting things and, and some validation stuff, right? But, <clears throat> But for the most part, uh, I was just very disappointed in that particular result. So, so my conclusion is that basically monolithic libraries are a thing of the past. You can't, they just make the library too brittle. Um, it, you know, I think the people who've discovered microservices architecture have realized this for a while. And I mean, I'm not saying that we can do microservice architecture because things like authenticate, if you really want to do authentication or, or uh, you know, access control and stuff like that in a microservice, uh, you're probably going to get really bad performance. But um, nevertheless, you know, um, it's, it's something that we need to address and we're planning on addressing it in ESAP E3, um, which... Uh, we are the the three people myself uh matt sile and jeremiah stacy are calling it three sappy uh shout out to jeremiah for that moniker um but when we do that we are going to do it radically different there's going to be an eSAPI core that's going to represent the interfaces and some common essential internal components that everything is going to depend on and those will be restricted from visibility using java modules and then we will separate implementation jars out for each major component. So that's how we're planning on doing that. All right. So I guess now it's time for where you get to ask me questions and I get to pretend that I know what I'm talking about. So that's it.